Well, Ken, I appreciate you giving us a little time to sit down and, and really uh, talk a little bit about uh, your life. You've lived an extraordinary life as well as the book. Um, you're one of those guys that you have lived a lot of life on your time so far on the planet. And uh, I know that you've an uh, army colonel, you were an attorney, uh, entrepreneur, um, of course the author of this new book, which we're going to get into. But before we get into all that, talk a little bit about, you know, your background, where you come from. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Dan. Uh, yep. I was born in Ames, Iowa, and uh, right after World War II, my family moved to Winter Haven, Florida. I attended public schools there until, uh, until uh, my senior year, and I went off to the Georgia Military Academy in Atlanta. Uh, following uh, graduation from GMA, I went to uh, Florida State University and got a degree in finance and then immediately uh, went to uh, the University of Florida to law school. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, pass the bar exam and uh, be uh, uh, granted a commission in the uh, Army's Judge Advocate General's Corps and uh, reported for active duty in uh, 1967. Spent four years with the Army, one year at Fort Gordon defending criminal uh, court martials, and a year in uh, Saigon. Yeah, and so you, Vietnam, that was, that was something. Well, if I, as I jokingly say to people, if everybody's war was like mine, we'd have them all the time because uh, <laughs> I, I lived in a hotel room, went to an office building, ate steak and drank a bottle of wine every evening, and. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I was one of the fortunate ones, and uh, we should all salute the service of the uh, young men who uh, were actually out uh, being warriors uh, and uh, keeping people like me safe. Sure, all of us really. Um, and for, I know you also did. Uh, you were at the Pentagon, that's, uh, or in the Pentagon, I should say. That, well, that's um, true. When I left, uh, when I left Vietnam. Uh, I had an opportunity to uh, do uh, what the Army refers to as legal assistance. I did that for a year at the Pentagon and then uh, moved out to Bailey's Crossroads just outside of D.C. and did criminal appellate defense work for a year. What was it like working in the Pentagon? Is it like the movies where you had the, the clearance and the... I know you probably can't talk about all of it. But. No, I can talk about <laughs> it. When I was there, it was uh, just a great big office building. Uh, you drove to work or rode the bus and... Uh, you stayed in that building all day long and then left, but uh, you, uh, I seldom saw anybody above the rank of colonel, but occasionally uh, there'd be uh, somebody with, uh, with uh, stars on their shoulders, mm -hmm. but uh, it was just like going to work anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there you went back home, and I don't know if we're on, what, the fourth career now, but did you start a career with Coca-Cola? Is that what happened next? I had uh, gone home, and uh, I'll never forget my dad waking me up one morning, shaking my shoulder and saying, uh, son, it's time for you to find work. <laughs> and uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be uh, employed by the Coca-Cola company in Atlanta. I had a uh, terrific uh, career uh, for, m for me as a boy from a small town in central Florida to uh, get to uh, watch these uh, titans of industry uh, at work, and I had six or seven different uh, different jobs there and, uh, and a wonderful time. I turned 40 and decided I really wanted to do something other than work for somebody, yeah. and so I, I went to work for a uh, commercial real estate brokerage company, and four years later f formed uh, my own. Your own, uh, and that was uh, Meridian? That was that right? Meridian Property Group, mm -hmm. and we, uh, we represented people who had a uh, million or five million dollars to invest and then manage that property for them and uh, we kept that company for about a quarter of a century. Wow. And do, are you still involved in commercial real estate today? I'm, I'm trying to become an author full time <laughs> but occasionally people ask me to be helpful to them and uh, it's awfully hard to turn them down uh, whether it's a former partner or a client. So. Uh, I'm doing about 20% real estate and 80% trying to get into the next book. Well, you're certainly making your your stamp in the in the writing world. I, I'm we're blown away so far by the uh, by the book. Let's talk about a little bit 
Um, what prompted you to write uh, the book? Well, my, great, my grandfather died when I was about 12 years old, and my father at that time inherited uh, some swords and a shotgun and a drinking cup and a telescope, uh, all of which were uh, the property of Captain Henry H. Griffiths, who was a Union artillery officer with the uh, Army of Tennessee in the 15th Corps and the 4th Division. And uh, my brother and I liked to sword fight when mom and dad were gone with the swords and uh, chop down banana trees uh, right. from time to time. I realized when I got to Atlanta that my great-grandfather had been present in Atlanta, uh, and I took it upon myself to see if I could discover where he had been in the various battlefields around Atlanta. And that began my, uh, my uh, search for uh, uh, good information in books. And as I did my research, I thought, gosh, uh, maybe I could write one of these that would at least be as good as the worst of them. And uh, hopefully I've been successful in that. Regard. Well, I think you've accomplished much more than that. Uh, the book, Seven Days in July, and it's the uh, historical account of the Battle of Atlanta. And I have to say, um, you mentioned doing some fact finding. Uh, there's, there's a real historical accuracy here. There's a lot of work that has gone into even the maps. Uh, talk a little about how much time you spent in the fact finding and why it was so important for you to be historically accurate. Well, what I wanted to do, of course, was find out where my great grandfather had been located. And uh, so I did a lot of research. I'd say half my time was spent reading, and half my time was spent writing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's uh, about an 85% history book, and mm -hmm. most of the history is uh, as good as I could make it. There are instances in which history obscures what uh, how something actually occurred or took sure. place, and uh, fiction allows you an opportunity to illuminate those dark corners and say, well, it could have happened like this. Yeah, and I think that's really necessary to help us in your mind's eye kind of get a clear picture of putting yourself there um, and filling in those little bits, and it's probably the most likely scenario of a lot of the things that could have actually happened. Um, in terms of uh, this book, what are some of the uh, misconceptions do you think that people have when it comes to uh, this specific battle? Well, I, certainly it was a misconception of mine. Lots of times people use the, uh, the process of fragmenting yeah. to make more clear a certain uh, aspect of a battle or some other problem. And uh, for convenience sake, I think hi historians have uh, have written about the Battle of Atlanta as the Battle at Peachtree Creek, the Battle around the Decatur Courthouse, the, and the Battle in East Atlanta as three separate uh, activities largely unrelated to each other. I've come to the conclusion that that's not uh, the, the factual correctly, uh, factually correct, that they were really three, three, three skirmishes but one battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would say that's one of the big things that people hopefully can take away from the book is that it's, uh, it's not a simple one, two, three. Sure. It's a great big complex one. So really, are you saying that historians got it wrong or really more of? Well, I think, I think lots of historians uh, may have learned it one way and uh, maybe sure. they weren't wrong, but I think it's inconsistent with the conclusion that I draw today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't want to say that they were wrong. I'd just say that uh, uh, further study may, uh, may uh, reveal the same truth that i found. <laughs> well, and so really what you're saying is instead of these three his independent battles, it was one battle and, uh, that took place. Well, I think that's exactly right. Uh, uh, Peach Tree, the battle at Peachtree Creek uh, occurred. It didn't stop, though, when the battle was taking place for the Battle of Atlanta. It continued, and uh, if uh, Thomas had not held uh, uh, General Stewart, the uh, Confederate Corps commander, in place, uh, the outcome on the east side of Atlanta might well have been different. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like, um, I have to say, you know, digging into this book, this is not a normal book that I would <laughs> pick up and probably read. And I got the, I had the pleasure of listening to you read uh, one of your favorite chapters from the book. And I have to say, I was really enthralled in, in what you were doing. It was very easy to put myself in the scene. It was a great uh, few scenes uh, that you covered in the chapter. And I'm interested now, and what I didn't realize 
is there's a lot of things that, that uh, this really, this battle influenced or even changed history. Talk a little bit about some of the events that may or may not have happened without this battle. Well, of course, the first thing that I can't let go is that if you're really interested in it, you ought to buy it and read it I will. yourself. <laughs> um, but uh, clearly, if the Union Army had not been successful at, in and around Atlanta, they would not have been successful in their march across Georgia. They would not have been successful and not, uh, they would not have captured Savannah. Uh, Abe Lincoln would not have been elected without the, uh, without the success story uh, in Atlanta and Savannah. Uh, we would have had two countries uh, uh, and a different way of life uh, without the success that occurred in wow. Atlanta. I think people would get a different, we'd have a different kind of a constitution and a different form of government. Wow, that's unbelievable. And uh, what is your main purpose, Ken? And uh, what do you want your readers to walk away with? When they read this book, what's the takeaway that you really want them uh, to get? Well, I hope that, uh, they, that they come away with the idea that uh, ordinary people make history. Uh, it's current events when it's going on, but uh, 150 years, uh, it turns it into history. And all of the people, uh, the, the men on both sides of the, uh, of the trench lines, uh, all contributed to uh, to uh, this history, and uh, it's uh, you don't have to be a, a general to uh, to influence it. Yeah, and not only is it historically accurate, but it's just a great read. If you want to escape and really get into a great piece of history, um, this is the book to pick up. Uh, how about can I, I was thinking uh, people? Let's say people that aren't interested in in war or American history, or let's say younger people that say, you know, why should I care about a battle like this? Happened 150 years ago. Why would they, why would it benefit them to, to take time to, to read a book like this? Well, the easy answer is that if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. And usually we don't say that as though you're going to repeat the good parts, you're going to repeat the That's bad right. parts. And uh, uh, so I think that an understanding of history whether it's the Civil War or the Revolutionary War or World War II or whatever the conflict may be, uh, learning what went, what went wrong and resulted in a war maybe allows the young people who are going to lead the country in the future to learn how to better avoid them in the first place. Sure. And, you know, like we mentioned, there's very specific things that we do learn about in school in terms of history. And this book did affect or influence many of those things. So. Definitely a great read, and I think it behooves anybody to go out and spend the time uh, to get into this. Uh, I have to ask, you've done so much in your, in your career so far, or I should say careers so far. Uh, what's next? What are you working on? Uh, I've got a second book uh, on the way. It's going to be a book about the, uh, all the historical markers around the city of Atlanta. Uh, it's, it's many places you can't stop your car, and if you do read the marker, it doesn't make any sense. So I've tried to organize them and give some context, and uh, hopefully it'll be a, a super coffee table book that uh, lots of wives will buy for their husbands. Yeah. Well, we certainly look forward to that book. We're excited about this. Uh, I want to ask you, in the process of writing, uh, I know it's very therapeutic, and you, certainly there's, a, especially with a book like this, there's a lot of research that goes into it. How has the writing of this book changed you um, in terms of um, the process or maybe some information you found? I know you mentioned that you found some personal information uh, in the book when you dug in. Well, I've, I've been able to locate on the battlefield, I believe within uh, 100 feet or so, uh, the location of the first Iowa and the first Illinois batteries that were under the command of my great grandfather. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when you go out on those, uh, they're covered up with the uh, houses and supermarkets today, but uh, you can still, if you close your eyes and listen, uh, you can still sort of hear the sound of guns and the, uh, and the clash of armies in these uh, red uh, hills of Atlanta. And uh, it's, uh, for, for a moment at least, you can imagine that you were there. Yeah, and I, I know that you even found out some interesting history in terms of your family as well, right, of being on the other side or? Well, there, there are instances in Captain Griffith's life uh, when he's at Port Gibson uh, after they've crossed the Mississippi and are trying to win their way around uh, 
uh, to uh, Vicksburg that uh, unbeknownst to him, uh, the, the, uh, the Confederate line that confronts them at Port Gibson contains a cousin of his and uh, they both uh, fire at each other unsuccessfully throughout the battle and uh, if they'd been better shots, I probably wouldn't be sitting wow. here today. Unbelievable. Well, again, the book is Seven Days in July, a historical account of the Battle of Atlanta. I recommend to go pick it up. It's, it's a phenomenal read. And I have to say, after hearing you read your favorite chapter, this is next on my list, so I'm going to give you the 20 bucks that it costs. Uh, where can people get it? I know that Amazon.com, you sure, can pick Sure, you can go to Amazon. You can also go to the web page that the uh, publisher is uh, sponsoring mm -hmm. for seven days in July. Yep. And uh, if you're lucky enough to find me on the street somewhere, you can get a book from me. Out of, we'll follow you out of the back of your car. <laughs> and I know the website is Indigo River Publishing. Uh, dot com as well. Go pick it up. You won't regret it. Thank you so much, Ken. We Thank look forward you, to digging Appreciate into this it. and we look forward to the next one. Keep us posted Great. on your progress. I, I will. Thank, Thank you, you very much.